Congratulations to Shane Hunt, a 760 raw squat, 501 bench press, got that up now, and a 903 deadlift, amazing lift. So what's cool about this is not only your newbie gains are one thing, a world-class lifter be, you know, going even higher is a whole nother thing. So I wanna share with you, um, I had the pleasure of working with Shane, I wanna share with you some strategies that work with Shane. So whether you're a strength coach, at an elite level, starting out as a personal trainer, or you're working at the All Subs gas station 90 miles northeast of Juarez, Mexico. The ex junior college rejects are out there, you know, turn carny, you know, meth head loitering around the front, and you got to pick them up and stop them. This is going to help you. So, in the words of Bruce Lee, remember. You want to use what's useful, discard what's not, and make it uniquely your own. There's going to be a bunch of gyms in here that can help you a ton. There may be just only one or two, but that's to make it worth it. So I'm very excited to help to, to let you know what helps Shane. No, point one, walking away. Walking away with more in the tank. So here's the deal. Um, I, I remember when I was in high school, I had the chance to visit with Barney Ames. Barney uh, Ames was a you know one of the best junior college coaches ever. He took over a failing Allen Hancock program and made it one of the best in the countries. And when we were talking, he said, "You know what?" He said, "The the hardest hits in football happen in alumni games and the first day in pads. Players are excited and they want to go out there and hit somebody. The reason that and I was thinking about that. The reason that happens, they're not centrally fatigued. They're not overall fatigued. They're they you know they're they're very excited. So what he did to duplicate that in games." is he kept his practices an hour and 45 minutes and rarely let everybody go full contact. And by the by game day, those players were like rabid dogs. They were so excited. And, um, you know, the rest is history. He won all sorts of championships out there. Um, I had another coach that I actually, the one I met Barney Ames through, Coach Fred Worker, uh, amazing coach. And I remember uh, his freshman football coach, I remember for our first game in league, we had seven league games, he said, I may not have the fastest horse in the hair race, but I'm not the freshest. And you know what's cool about that? Us fresh horses, not only did we win every league game, literally no one scored on us. So I learned a lot right there. But what these two guys had in common is they walked away with something in the tank. So I, years later, talking to Ed Coney, I always talked away about how your best training cycles were you just walk away. You know, it's like I had a hell of a workout. I know I could have done more, and I'm like walking out of there. I'm so excited, I just can't hide it. I wanna just attack the pig iron. And that's what we wanna duplicate, get that sort of walk away. That's exactly what Shane. Shane worked harder than Ugly Stripper, but we kept the, you know, most of the volume was submaximal volume. The, you know, we got volume through the accessory pump body work, building work. Sometimes, you know, get it through variations of the core lift, things like that. The strongman training before it got really, you know, it didn't get super heavy, things like that allowed Shane to work hard, smart, get in and out, and very excited stuff. Walked away with something in the tank and had very positive momentum. So the application point is, um, look at your stimulus to fatigue ratio. Anything you do in your, in your training causes some sort of stimulus. That stimulus results in some sort of fatigue that subsequently adapts. So is it, look at the stimulus, look at how much fatigue it causes, and is the adaptation work it for for instance if i go on top of this punching bag right here and jump and, and jump head first is assuming i don't break my neck my neck would get potentially stronger that way but that would be very stupid because the fatigue that would cause my body and risk injury would the, the adaptation would be so low it'd be insane so look at things like that is the trade-off is this trade-off the stimulus that it worth the fatigue or is the stimulus and fatigue worth adaptation? Think about it. Is the trade-off worth it? Ask yourself that. Okay. Next up, strongman off-season training. Okay. Powerlifting. So that's the second point. Powerlifting. Um, a powerlifting meet requires very specific training. 
all that matters is what you lift on meat day. So you need to be your strongest, you know, two to three, to, two to three days out of the year at your meat. So that requires very, you know, doing the core lifts, mastering with very heavy weight, okay? So the way you train for a powerlifting meet before you start a peaking training cycle is with phase potentiation. That means you sequence your training. One phase builds on another, and when done right, that's gonna result in a much more efficient um, peaking process. Yeah, I remember Kaz said, you know, the, 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 the bigger, you know, the bigger the base of the pyramid, the higher you can build it. And that's the idea with off-season training, okay? Off-season training, you know, prevents uh, fruitless fatigue, overtraining injuries, overuse things, even acute injuries, because you're not, you know, all that different stuff. Off-season training can help you add muscle, strengthen weak points, increase strength potential, muscle hypertrophy, and increase your work capacity and also provide a novelty stimulus. A novelty stimulus, assuming it actually helps your training, is very beneficial, okay? So Shane's, specifically for Shane by training Strongman, his work capacity increased. The strength of his posterior chain increased. Uh, his, his explosive strength increased. His grip strength increased and his knees became more healthy in the progress. I've been having people do backwards sled drives for like 20 years. And uh, this really helps build leg drop, keep the knees healthy, all those things. So the main you beneficial events for Shane were to backwards sled drag, farmers walking, yoke. And for most powerlifting, those would be like the big three strongman off-season training events. So over time, you know, you think about it, over time, muscles and your CNS become less sensitive to it. You're getting ready for a meet. So your muscles and your central nervous system become less, less uh, sensitive to a repeated stimulus. So AKA, if all you're ever doing is bench pressing, squatting and deadlift in a competition style, your body's gonna get desensitized to that. And, and, and after a while, it can even make your technique go backwards. So what we wanna do is to have a directed variation that predicts, predicts excuse me, prevents that adaptive resistance so there's obviously different ways you can do it you can do like um you know in a less extreme case and, and uh, we use this here too in the off season is you use variations of the core lift so a low bar squat becomes a high bar squat you know a bench press becomes a close grip bench press a you know a conventional deadlift becomes a sumo deadlift so on and so forth that's one way we do it and that's then we use a lot of that in there using variations like a lot of ssb work using opposite stance deadlifts, but a, a very good directed, a directed variation um, is strongman training. So you, um, you think about that, the application point here for you is, think about strongman training. I mean, you go, you look, look at some of the strongman training, there's a lot of people with really bad form that deadlift a hell of a loss. You, you look at the, you go to like some beginner, you know, CrossFit barbell class, and literally there are strongmen that do over 900 pounds, the deadlift the same style they've never done it before you know because conventional deadlift is not a real high skill lift but the strongman training builds that bare wrestling strength the kind that um, it quickly potentiates into powerlifting strength so you have to you know one of the best ways to get in it the central fatigue is not super high here if you're not a competitive strongman so like i you know shane can deadlift 900 so if he does a farmer's walk with 260 pounds in each hand that is not that. That's more of a localized, you know, fatigue than a crazy central fatigue, actually. Because if we push that to the level, he'd be doing 400 in each hand. So the central, even you know, the purpose of off season is to get that muscular fatigue, keep it more localized, and give the CNS a bit of a rest too. And, and even though the strongman training for most would be centrally demanding, he's not neural. He's not that neurally efficient machine yet, like he already is in powerlifting. Okay. Um, another one is priming the central nervous system, okay? A lot, you know, you think about it. You go to the embassy suites, they got their cocktail hour, right? So all the hillbillies go in there and they think of how much can I get away with drinking, you know, without getting kicked out of here or getting too hung over. A lot of people in power do the exact same thing. They're always looking at their maximum recoverable volume, okay? You don't need to do that. If something's a new, so again, we're priming the central nervous system. So Shane and I have been doing any jump training, so we want to prime the central nervous system, prime the training session with jumps, okay? So instead of doing like some NSCA circle jerk, 
and you know go okay we're gonna go, what do they say 100 jumps in a session or something all he needs is the you know the minimal the minimal volume to get the proper stimulus okay so you call it minimal stimulus volume with a new stimulus so what that in this case is literally before a, a deadlift workout we do different variations of squats it could be you know a ssb squat it could be a camber bar squat high bar squat whatever and he does you know either singles or doubles six sets with a you know like 55 to 60 percent of max focus on doing compensatory acceleration style and after each one he does some sort of jump so sh those six jumps were game changing he doesn't need that much volume so instead of looking at the maximum yeah he could recover from 50 jumps probably as so an animal what's the point we get you know why work overtime when you can literally get paid the same for working 10 hours a week and that's how you got to look at this so the jumps helped prime Shane's nervous system to deadlift more explosively, squat more explosively, okay? So application point here, as long as you meet the, I'll put a couple notes here. If you meet the following criteria, you have less than 20% body fat, injury-free knees, hips, and lower backs. You can raw squat and deadlift 1.5 times your body weight and you're under 40. It would be a good idea at some points to try some jumps to stimulate your nervous system. Five to 10 jumps, prior to squats and deadlifts, and it's gonna make all the difference in the world, okay? So next one is eat big, total big. What do I mean by that? You think about it. You're, um, you know, you got everything going. You know, sleep's dialed in, nutrition's dialed in, you know, hitting PRs like you're going out of style, supplements dialed in, all that stuff. You have the big mo, momentum is on your side, okay? So it's, it's awesome stuff. Then, you know, you're, you're, you're in the iron priesthood. You're in the convent of gains. So what you do from there is all of a sudden, hey, I'm going to, you know, instead of a lot of lifters do, instead of just riding that momentum and making, you know, till the end, what they'll do is they um, start cutting weight. So that's Shane did not do that. He, he slowly over time inched up his weight. He weighed in like 272 or so and started the training cycle, you know, a little bit lighter than that. So what that did is you know let him build on his momentum mass moves mass but there's always there's a psychological thing that shane became the conductor of the strength symphony band he was in complete control had he had he started cutting weight it would have gone from this beautiful synergistic strength symphony to some shit show karaoke in west by god virginia on dollar sake night so the snowball momentum equaled synergy. So the application point here is do not cut weight for meats unless you're going for some kind of record, okay? You got into powerlifting to get as strong as possible and you ain't gonna get as strong as possible eating wild rice and skinless poultry. Remember that, eat big, total big, okay? Next up, and the final point here, is undulating weeks. We touched on this with a video with Derek. This happens a lot of fast gainer lifters. So you have your smart lifts, you have your dumb lifts. Smart lifts are the ones that require neurological complexity. For instance, if you're chasing this a big, you know, you're chasing a big snatch, you need to. It's gonna. It requires more technique than if you're just, you know, doing a big conventional deadlift. So going after the snatch is gonna require a lot higher frequency than a, a big conventional deadlift. Fast gainers, people that are primarily fast twitch muscle fibers, need less. They're like Shane. He's a neurologically efficient fast twitch, twitch machine. Shane gains faster than most people. That's a blessing, but it's also a curse because that means he cannot handle as much volume and frequency as a slow gainer. So, um, what we do to combat this is a lot of lifters, what they'll do is they go heavy one week they go light the next week okay so they go into alternating undulating style like that and um and and so they you know the problem with that we kind of you know we're a little under stimulated that way so what i like to do is go medium heavy one week and then real heavy the next week in one so we go medium heavy squat or really heavy deadlift medium heavy deadlift really heavy squat so you know it might be like someone like shane if he's going to like 660 for a double one week before he pulls into the eights on the heavier day so it's not real light it's a medium heavy heavy medium heavy heavy in an alternating undulating sense that what that does is that balance of stimulus 
fatigue recovery and adaptation. That's all it says is we're looking at risk to benefit ratio, balancing stimulus, fatigue, recovery, and adaptation. You got those things about, you know, you got those things balanced. You're off to the races. Okay. So sumo deadlifting is, a, is a, the lift that, co that requires the most technical efficiency in powerlifting. And um, we had that dialed in right there. So it, it was, um, you know, so what, and Shane, uh, after that started to stall a little bit, you know, what I do is I, I like to go, I'd like to get a weak and conventional there. It's kind of a backup plan too. So go heavy sumo, you know, medium conventional, heavier sumo, then do the sumo on the deload weeks. And, and, it, and it was amazing. So application point here for you is fast gainers do very well in an undulating style. You gotta remember the law of individual differences. If you're somebody that one of your individual differences is you're more of a fast twitch athlete, um, you you might you really should consider as you get stronger in the undulating style. So, you know, if you're deadlifting, you're you know you're grown man, you're you weigh 180 and you're deadlifting 280. You know, this isn't for you. This is for you know you you can get to that point. You keep building your strength up and build world class strength. You absolutely can get to that point, but. You know, starting off, this is for an advanced lifter strategy. So I am very proud of you, Shane. You did a great job. And in the word of old blue eyes, Frank Sinatra, the best is yet to come.